A quick art montage is shown on screen. Screen Reads at Home with the DIA presents Behind the Scene, the DIA Essentials. Frida Giblin, a slideshow and an American Sign Language interpreter appear Hi, on screen. Hi, my name is Frida Giblin. I am an interpretive program volunteer or docent with the Detroit Institute of Arts. And I'm so happy to be here today to be with you and tell you a little bit about some of the DIA's uh, best known and loved works of art. So today I'll be giving a lecture on DIA, The Essentials. New slide shows a portrait of Van Gogh. Our first piece is Vincent Van Gogh's self-portrait of 1887. Uh, Van Gogh is, um, is a painter uh, and I think just about everybody's heard his name. He has been an incredible influence on the modern and contemporary painters and artists of this time. Um, his painting style was so distinctive that during his lifetime, he only sold one painting. However, his fellow artists admired his innovative work. He um, did about 30 to 35 self-portraits. Um, and he really had a fairly short career uh, from the time he was 21 um, to, uh, excuse me, from the time he was 28 um, until he died about nine years, nine or 10 years later. Altogether, he produced over 900 works of art. Um, he was the son of a Protestant Dutch minister and studied to become a minister. Um, however, that didn't work out and um, he went to art school. Um, he moved to Paris where he uh, stayed with his brother, Theo, T-H-E-O, and became acquainted with the Impressionists who painted outdoors and used very sunny colors, like some of the blues and yellows you see here. Um, Van Gogh was also um, influenced by Japanese prints um, which likewise had influenced the Impressionist painters. Uh, these prints had large expanses of color uh, laid out in pretty flat surfaces. So here you'll see Van Gogh uh, from his Paris days, he was happy. He used bright yellow. You can see his bold strokes. Uh, he used broad strokes. He used a lot of things to paint with, even his fingernails. His portraits of other people show an intense reverence and a love of humanity. Um, which came from his feelings, uh, his religious uh, feelings. Um, so, Vincent Van Gogh. By the way, this is the first Van Gogh painting to enter an American public art museum. Um, so, we're very happy to have this piece. New slide shows a painting of a table and chair, 1916. Our second uh, piece of art is The Window by Henri Matisse, a French artist who was an Impressionist. Now, I mentioned them before as mainly painting outside and using nice sun-drenched colors. Um, Matisse sort of um, worked with the Impressionists, but he also went along his own way 
to represent things in his own style. Here we see he uses very few colors and he doesn't quite show a lot of depth. Before I mentioned that the Impressionists were influenced by Japanese prints. The Japanese prints had expanses of color and not a lot of distinction between what's nearby and what's far away. Here when you see the window, if you take a look at the left side, you'll see the wall morphing into the floorboards, morphing into, as you get closer at the bottom, the rug. Looks pretty flat. You don't see a line that sort of tells you, well, that's where the floor starts and where the wall begins. So he doesn't divide the space, wall, floor. Take a look at the white line right in the middle. That's the sun streaming in. And the Renaissance painters would use sunlight as a compositional device. But they would show the sun hitting the floor and it would take an angle. Here, Matisse shows one white, broad swath just going straight down. So he's really flattening, again, the whole space. The tabletop tilts towards you. It looks like the bowl uh, and flowers in it are going to slide off. This is Matisse's own vision of what he sees. Right around that time, Cubism was popular, where artists like Picasso used spheres, rectangles, boxes to show shapes of things. And Matisse sort of says, well, you can do cubism. Here's my style. So he was quite an original. New slide shows an ethereal Let's Italian look at our next painting. piece. And we're going to go to the 1500s with Tintoretto and the Dreams of Men. Well, if you were going to have a painting right over your bed, what might it be? Back in 1500s, in the 1500s, Tintoretto made this painting for the ceiling of a wealthy merchant, uh, the merchant's bedroom. And it shows a um, painting of what men might wish for. Fame, fortune, love. Fame is represented by this woman here with the trumpet. Uh, the wealth, fortune, is shown by these coins. Love. Uh, Cupid, um, Cupid and Venus are normally the uh, figures that people would recognize as being associated with love. The artist is saying, if you want to accomplish something, do it because time and opportunity are fleeting. Time is represented in, um, I'm having a little bit of problem seeing this. Uh, there's an hourglass uh, behind the youth. 
um, and um, and uh, opportunity um, is shown uh, with a clear glass sphere right here on the bottom. So um, this tells you to go out and accomplish what you want to before it's too late. This painting is located in the DIA in one of the galleries and it's on the ceiling. So you have to look up to see it or there is a mirror that you can look down onto that reflects the ceiling. New slide shows a shelved alcove of brightly colored objects, 1927. Have you ever lost something for a long time and then years later you found it again? This Powabic niche at the DIA, uh, right inside the American Gallery, was um, they put uh, some plasterboard over it back in 1969 because um, objects like these were considered a little too craft like, crafty, and it wasn't quite modern. We found them again when some renovations uh, took place uh, around 2005 and they were completed in 2007. And we're delighted to have them back. The Powabic niches are made of Powabic tiles. Powabic, which you can see back here, they're nice and iridescent, meaning that they sparkle like a copper penny. Um, Powabic is the Ojibwa word for metal. Ojibwa, O-J-I-B-W-A. It's a Native American group uh, from Michigan. Um, Mary Chase Stratton um, founded Powabic pottery in 1903 along with her partner, uh, who was a dentist, and founded a kiln uh, that she used to make these, uh, her pottery, her ceramics, with these glazes. The recipes back then contained um, things like lead and mercury. So even though Powabic pottery still exists on Jefferson Avenue today, you can go and see their shop, uh, the formulas have changed. Um, in addition, um, some of the glazes, uh, the iridescence was achieved originally by injecting kerosene into the kiln while the ceramics were fired. And today they use vegetable oil instead, which is much safer. Um, we have Powabic pottery, not only uh, in these niches, but also in other places in the DIA, uh, on the floor of the great Hall and the Revere Court and in the Detroit Film Theater. And these were commissioned by the museum. New slide shows a painted scene, 1640. Our next piece is the visitation by Rembrandt, very well known artist of the Dutch Golden Age. This is a scene from the Christian Bible, the book of Luke. Here is Mary, pregnant with Jesus, greeting her older cousin Elizabeth, pregnant with St. John the Baptist. Rembrandt frequently uses dramatic lighting 
to highlight people's faces as he does here. The light seems to come from up here, perhaps. It signifies the uh, light of God or light from God. And the light on these women's faces indicates their holiness. The visitation actually depicts a time before there was a Christian religion. So we'll take a look at some symbols. Uh, by the way, coming down the staircase is Zacharias, the husband of Elizabeth, and he's being helped by a young boy. In the background are the buildings of Jerusalem, and there is a man coming up these back stairs with a donkey. This is Joseph with the donkey. Joseph is the husband of uh, Mary. And a maidservant is helping Mary take off her cloak. Um, the dog over here is a symbol of fidelity. Um, it's a symbol used in the Dutch culture. There is a rose bush, which symbolizes Mary. Ro uh, roses would symbolize Mary. The thorns would symbolize the crucifixion of Jesus. Over here, there's a peacock or peahen, and there's some little chicks over here. In Roman mythology, Juno is a peacock and uh, she protects women in childbirth. Peacocks also symbolize immortality. Uh, right over here, it's a little difficult to read, this is where Rembrandt signs his name. Now, at this time, um, the uh, Dutch people were, uh, m many Dutch people were of the Calvinist religion, C-A-L-V-I-N-I-S-T. And that religion forbade having paintings and stained glass in churches, and also the painting of religious subjects. So it's very likely that Rembrandt uh, might have had a Catholic patron who commissioned this painting. New slide shows a sculpture dated 1280 to 1320. Artist is unknown. We're going to the other side of the world. This is Shakyamuni, S-H-A-K, Y-A-M-U-N-I. Um, it's a sculpture about 12 inches high made from one piece of wood. The robes of Shakyamuni were painted red. His face was painted gold. Why? Because Shakyamuni uh, was to become uh, the founder of Buddhism. Uh, and Buddha is always uh, shown with a face of gold. This is just before he comes bo uh, the Buddha. After he has spent six years fasting and meditating in a cave, you can see his shin bones, uh, his arms, he looks emaciated. Um, and uh, he is recognizable because Shakyamuni had long earlobes from wearing heavy earrings when he was a prince uh, by the name of Prince Siddhartha, S-I-D-D-H-A-R-T-H-A which meant sage 
of the Shakyas, S-H-A-K-Y-A-S, and that was his clan. Frida circles um, around the crown of the sculpture's we head. We want to also take a look at this and this. These are also signs of the Buddha. This was made in China during the Yuan Dynasty, Y-U-A-N. The Yuan Dynasty was the time of Genghis Khan, G-E-N-G-H-I-S, Khan, K-H-A-N, uh, and his son Kublai, K-U-B-L-A-I, Khan. And at this time, artists explored making three-dimensional, natural-looking forms. And I'm going to quote the former curator of Asian art. Carved during a period noted for realism and exquisite ornamentation, this is the finest Chinese Shakyamuni sculpture of its time still in existence. So many people from um, all over come to see this piece as they do many other pieces of art that I'm showing you today. Um, what is this statue saying to us? Um, it, it would appeal to the Chan, C-H-A-N, Buddhists, or Zen, Z-E-N, Buddhists, um, which is the Chinese and Japanese way of, of, of calling this, um, who maintain that enlightenment is achieved through self-discipline, exhaustive effort, and intense concentration or meditation. New slide shows a painting of people dancing, 1566. Our next piece is The Wedding Dance by Peter Bruegel, the elder. Um, this is another very rare piece. There are only three Bruegel, the elder paintings in uh, the United States. Uh, so we're very lucky to have this. Um, it was found in London in 1930 by uh, William Valentiner, V-A-L-E-N-T-I-N-E-R, who was the first uh, director of the DIA who was a trained art historian. Um, Peter Bruegel the Elder um, was Netherlandish, uh, which is that area sort of north of France. He was an engraver who also painted. Um, and this is a scene of a wedding. Well, let's find the bride. The bride is wearing her best dress. She's over here in a black dress and red hair. Um, her husband might be this gentleman here. We don't know for sure. Custom kept the bride and groom apart. Bruegel was a powerful observer of human nature. He exaggerated some of the human behavior in his works. And so you see people with exaggerated arm movements. Uh, they look a little bit awkward, but they're having a great time. Um, now, it may have um, a cautionary message uh, that frenzied dance and lustful behavior. Uh, here is, for example, a Spanish soldier grabbing a woman. 
Uh, and here is a man grabbing at this woman. Uh, so frenzied dance and lustful behavior could lead to sin and damnation. At this time, um, the Spanish were in control of uh, the Netherlands. And they wanted to impose their religion, Catholicism. Much of this area uh, was Protestant, however. And the Spanish would have looked down uh, upon um, the practices in this wedding dance, um, and they would have not have liked it. Um, so Bruegel, before he died, asked his wife to destroy all of his paintings. Um, luckily, this one survived. Um, and so uh, we, we, we now have it, which is good. Why don't I, I think it's running a little bit late. Why don't I do one more? And that is going to be Mushushu New slide dragon. shows a dragon, 604 to 562 BCE. M-U-S-H, H-U-S-H, S-H-U. <laughs> um, symbol of Marduk, M-A-R-D-U-K, the patron god of Babylon. Babylon. Here's a city from your uh, world history classes <laughs> from middle school and high school. Um, Babylon uh, is located in current day Iraq in the fertile crescent between the Tigris, T I G R I S, and Euphrates, E U P H R A T E S rivers. And this is where uh, civilization, uh, this is called sort of like the cradle of civilization, the Fertile Crescent. So Marduk, the patron god of Babylon, had his symbol Mushushu. If you saw Mushushu, you would know that Marduk was there to protect you. And this is part of the Ishtar Gate, a gate that was 60 feet high. And it had this beautiful blue, dark blue glazed ceramic tile in the background. Uh, and there were many Mushushus on this gate alternating with many bulls that were also of this golden color. The bulls were the symbol of Adar, A-D-A-R, the weather god who brought the rain. Very necessary for all those great crops they were growing. But Mushushu is this fabulous animal that's got mm, all these scales on his body. So he's got the body of a snake. His front paws are those of a lion. His back legs uh, have the talons of a bird of prey, like an eagle. He's got the tail of a scorpion. He's got the head of a viper. Um, and so uh, this was a fearsome looking creature. Um, so peop once a year, there would be this uh, major celebration during New Year. Now they used a lunar calendar. So New Year was in April-ish. And once a year there would be a procession coming under the Ishtar Gate. So it would be pretty magnificent looking. Uh, visitors, uh, visiting dignitaries, prisoners would all be awed by this gate. When Babylon fell to Alexander the Great, 
in 331 BCE. Uh, he didn't destroy the gate. He planned to make Babylon his capital. Um, he died before that happened. But um, so how did we get this? In uh, 1899, uh, a number of German archaeologists came and they asked the Iraqi government if they could try to dig up uh, and try to find artifacts from Babylon. They found the Ishtar Gate and they were allowed to take many of the remnants back, much of it was destroyed, but they could rebuild the Ishtar Gate in a museum near Berlin, Germany. They built, they didn't have enough to build the whole thing, of course, so they built it about two-thirds high. So instead of 60 feet high, they made a gate that was 40 feet high. But they had three mushushus left over. We have one of them. Um, so we're very happy to have it. Um, so I think with that, I'm going to conclude my talk. Uh, I'd be happy to come back and tell you more uh, of some of the DIA's most fabulous works of art. But I thank you for having me today and hope to see you again. Frida Smiles. Video ends.